story. When I was five, I visited a zoo for the first time. And let me tell you, I was beyond excited. When I left, I was in complete awe, like any five-year-old would be. The next day at school, I made sure I told each and every single one of my friends and teachers how cool the zoo was. How awesome it was to see these helpless animals locked away in small cages for our entertainment. You see, when you're five, you don't really think about these things. And when you see something new, like a zoo, you rarely think about how the animals got there and what they're going through now. Before I go on, I just want to let everyone know this is not going to be a speech about going vegan or boycotting zoos. This is going to be about people. Now, we can all agree that zoos are a classic attraction, and whether we agree or disagree with their existence, we're always used to the animals being in the cages. People haven't been displayed in zoos for our entertainment ever since the 19th century, or so we think. Now, a show of hands, who here is appalled by the idea of human zoos? Who here would actually like to be in a cage in a human zoo? Now, let me tell you another story. Just a bit of context. The Golden Triangle is where Thailand, Myanmar, and Laos meet. Myanmar and Laos being where a majority of the hill tribe groups are located and originate from. Now, in the area of the Golden Triangle, there has always been bad blood and tension. And in times such as communism, the resistance against communism, colonization, and basically any type of social and political conflict, the hill tribes are the ones that had it worst. One big aspect of culture from the hill tribes is their cultivation of opium. And because of their expertise on it, they were always exploited by it, by whoever was in power and wanted to make money out of it. They were victims of corruption from national armies and um, any type of political and regional conflict. Now, one thing that is slapped onto basically every single ad for in Thailand are the hill tribe, group, uh, the hill tribe tourists in villages. And we live in a world where traveling is one of the joys in life. And usually when people go to Asia for the first time, they book a tour. So everything they're going to see is planned out, and they don't have to worry about it. They don't want to worry about it. That's the thing. You're going on vacation. You want to relax. Not write another essay. Now, uh, when you go to Asia for the first time, most people usually save up for these holidays. So to them, there's not much of a difference if they're seeing a waterfall or a hill tribe. They're seeing something. They're being enriched with culture and beauty, and it's an abundance for the senses. Rarely do people start investigating things and start going deep into whatever's happening. They're not going to start doing research. No. They're going to start taking photos. And then you're going to put those photos on Facebook and on Instagram, and you'll get like 300 likes, because what you're seeing is beautiful and exciting and new. Now, I have been to Chiang Mai and Chiang Rai twice. And the first time I went there, I was wowed by the Long Mick women, just like everyone we were traveling with. But when I went back this year, it just wasn't the same. Maybe it's one of those things that was a 12 factor when you see it more than once. Maybe I grew up and I'm not the passive 12 year old who wanted to go back to the hotel and watch Hannah Montana. Or maybe I just started realizing I'm sure most of you are familiar with the um, Long Neck Women. They belong to the Kari tribe, and they are um, most famous for the brass rings around their necks, which push down the collarbones, giving the illusion of an extended neck or spine, hence the name Long Neck. Now, um, amazing just of these problems is, you walk in, pay 250 to 300 baht, which is roughly seven to nine US dollars, and you're greeted by the women standing around selling knickknacks. Thing is, some of the women there may not even belong to the Kara tribe, but being in a touristic village is much better than being in a refugee camp. Yeah, some of the women, most of the people in the villages, as a matter of fact, do not have citizenship and virtually no rights. So what they receive in the villages, since it's a private business, none of them are government owned, they receive food, basic health care, and their children receive education. Now, this is more than they're entitled to, because if they would be in a, tourist, in a refugee camp, they would not receive half of what they do in these villages. Like I said, these people are refugees, so they don't, don't really have mobility. The woman in Meho Song can only travel around the town, which is 245 kilometers away from Chiang Mai. The men technically have more mobility than the women, but they should not have that much either, because they have no citizenship either. But the police turn the blind eye. 
Why? It makes money. 10 to 15 tourists visit these villages on a daily basis. And this does not include groups or tours. That's obviously a lot of people. Like I said, the only thing that really happens in those villages is the women standing around selling knickknacks. And whenever you buy your ticket, people encourage you, the ones who are selling it to you, encourage you to buy their knickknacks. But if they say that they make them and it supports their livelihood, and this makes perfect sense, only if what they sold didn't have made in China on the back. It was easy to find at most night markets. The picture that's painted by these villages is nowhere close to the reality of these women used to live. In traditional villages, they would be cultivating crops, harvesting, raising their children, weaving, cooking, doing something other than standing around. Because it this is basically a human zoo. Nowhere close to the reality of these women used to live. Now, uh, my dad can speak Thai, so this year when we went back, it had more of an impact on me seeing these women. It really opened my eyes because I had more of an interaction with them rather than just taking photos and asking them how much whatever it is they're selling. It gave a voice to the faces on the postcards. They became people, no longer exhibits. Um, one thing that is embedded into my memory and will be for many long years was their eyes, the way their whole face changed. And one, one, one woman specifically almost brought me to tears. She, uh, she's a refugee from Burma. She's been in Thailand for the past 17 years. And we asked her if she had any children. And when we did, her whole face lit up. But at the same time, it was somber. She has two daughters. One of them went to school, the other one didn't. But they both ended up in the same village with her. Both had rings around their necks. She had a small Burmese guitar for sale, and she started playing it for us. And the song that she played was one of the saddest I heard in a long time. She, um, so, yeah. One thing that we all noticed while my father was talking to them, was how hard it was for some of them to actually comprehend Thai and to talk in Thai. And this only served as proof to how, to how isolated these women are. It took me a while to realize how wrong these women just felt. Cultures and traditions are at stake, but morally it just feels so wrong to have these poor women endure this kind of treatment. And I see women because the men just sit behind the stalls and chew beetle up like nobody's business. But to have these poor women have to endure flocks of cameras and flashes in their face on a daily basis because their culture is nowhere close to what we deem as normal. So, after listening to me for the past, what, eight, seven minutes, you must all be thinking, what does she want from me? Not much. Just for people to be informed. Because the only way to bring change is through awareness. And in order to do this, tell your tour guide you don't want to see human zoos. Be specific. Know where you're going, what you're seeing. Because again, that's the only way to bring change through awareness. And remember, there are faces behind the postcards, and there are hopes and dreams, and just souls underneath those rings. And things like this can't change overnight, because a 16-year-old decided to do a TED Talk on them. Things like this take time. They take time to heal and patience and care just like a wound. And the only way to heal a wound is the time and patience and care, not by staring at it at all. And the first step to healing it is knowing there's a wound to heal. Thank you.